Um, so let me just summarize where we are, what we're doing today, what we're going to be doing next week. In terms of uh, where we are, um, we're getting towards, well, we will finish up chapter three today. So what that means, guys, is that chapter one, you can identify what is a mistake easily enough. Chapter one also identifies what is a trust, which sometimes, not often, be challenging, probably not going to be an issue that you see in your own practice. Chapter two deals with just the commonalities that subchapter J is share, shared with virtually all the other code sections with some nuances. And chapter three is the real distinguishing uh, feature of subchapter J, J, which is this distribution reduction, which is unique to trust the states. And throughout uh, chapter three, we saw this concept of how you compute distribution deduction, and we know that's encapsulated in this concept of distributable net income found in section 643, and distinguished between DNI and fiduciary accounting income. Uh, fiduciary accounting income is defined um, in the Principal and Income Act, and we saw how to compute DNI and how it includes tax exempt income, but the distribution deduction, to back out the tax exempt income, why is DNI include tax exempt income? Because of character issues in the hands of the beneficiaries. Uh, we, in chapter three, distinguish between simple trust and complex trust, uh, reflected in both code sections. 651, 652, looked at complex trust, 661, 662. Uh, we noted, or I noted, you guys know, that um, <coughs> all estates were categorized as complex trust for purposes of the Internal Revenue Code. We saw, with respect to complex trust, um, that there are so-called tier one and tier two distributions. And we saw that tier one distributions pull out DNI first, tier two distributions pull out whatever is left. We looked at, and I will emphasize again, that when it comes to so-called specific requests, it takes you back to your income tax days in code section 102A. And the receipt of a request or a gift, if you recall, under 102A is not subject to tax. And similarly, Code Section 663 says that when you make specific bequests, it does not pull out DNI, and those bequests will be free of income tax, right? So everyone has in their minds the general rules of complex and simple trust, and will not forget Code Section 663 for purposes of the final exam, okay? That's important, you don't want to forget it. And we'll see today when we start off with the problem, we'll see that emphasized. Um, throughout the course, emphasize the fact that unlike partnerships and S corporations, losses generally are not passed through, right? Notwithstanding one case where even the judge got it wrong, or the, excuse me, the IRS got it wrong, taxpayer got it wrong, where it intimated that losses were currently distributed, that doesn't happen, right? Um, with the trust, if at all, um, losses can possibly, in the final year, under Code Section 642H, be distributed, okay? Out to beneficiaries. Not the um, <coughs> exemption amount, but rather excess losses, um, capital losses, NOLs, those sort of things can, in the year of termination, pass through to the beneficiaries, all right? Um, and I think that largely brings us up to date with some of the salient things. The one other thing towards the very end, um, and we'll see some issues regarding this stuff that we've seen before, the Keenan case, that um, if you have to satisfy a specific request with a specific sum of money that constitutes a recognition event, right? Keenan be commissioner, um, so be forewarned that uh, it will 
potentially trigger gain or loss. Uh, losses you always have to be careful about because as you guys know, Section 267 may put the brakes on uh, permitting or allowing a loss, okay? So logistically, any questions or substantively, any questions about the course material today? So let me give you a little foreshadowing of what's to come. Um, so we are going to finish chapter three tonight, and it's been several weeks in the making. Uh, we'll finish chapter three easily enough. And then uh, we're gonna march in and talk about grantor trust, okay? Uh, and it will probably take two to three classes to finish our discussion of grantor trust. And as I said at the beginning of the course, uh, chances are next class or the following class, I'll distribute material either vis-a-vis -vis Blackboard. Everyone's getting black, periodically I've sent Blackboard messages. Everyone's on Blackboard, so if I send a message. So I may distribute, um, we're probably gonna cover charitable trust and IRD, income with respect to decedent. And um, probably early next week, if things fall into place, I'll distribute material related to that so that you'll have it. Um, because chapter five of this case book, I and my brothers, and I've spoken to both authors about this. Um, in the year 2016, 2017, 2018, not going to be the big issues. They, they haven't been big issues, in my opinion, for the last 15, 20 years. So, uh, for you to go, and so chapter five, not a real, in my mind, an important chapter. Chapter six is an interesting chapter. It deals with, um, I forget what the title they, they call it here. Is it just, it's IRD, income with respect to the scene in Section 691. But I think it's better if I Xerox up a chapter on IRD uh, that deals specifically with it, as opposed to just looking at a whole series of cases. I think your time will be better spent if I highlight the rules themselves than if you just try to plow through 20 cases, okay? so. Um, let me see if I can make your life easier um, with that. So that's the objective, guys. We finished chapter four, two or three classes. We march on to travel with trust, and then we march on to IRD as the finale. Uh, we finished all that. In my opinion, your Wednesday nights and mine uh, have been well spent, okay? But you'll be the judge of that. Um, one other thing, if you, if, if, I don't know if this works for everyone. Um, Next week, if we can go a little bit later, past 9, let's say 9.15, 9.20, 9.25 at the latest. And here's why. So there's the downside. The, the upside is that the following week, I think it's November 8th or 9th, Lisa, um, if we can have class from 6 to 8, uh, I am giving a speech in Baltimore, Maryland, the next day. So I have to... Uh, <coughs> commute down to Baltimore. So if we put a little bit more time to next week, it will allow me to shorten um, class the following week. So if that works, does every, that's not gonna send anyone off the deep end, right? It should go a little bit later next week and we end at eight o'clock the following week. Does that work? Is that fair exchange? <laughs> that's okay. If you have a problem, let me know. Good news for, or bad news for anyone, so I'm being taped, so we can always, if, can't make uh, the full class next week. Um, somehow you can pick it up on video. Okay. All right, so um, that gives you a little bit more foreshadowing if we can pull this off for the next few weeks. All right, so let's pick up where we left off, guys. Um, we talked about you know the famous Keenan case, and we talked about some of the situations where there might be gain recognition with respect to specific request equalization clauses um, and, and the like, the, the authors um, illustrated some of that. For exam purposes, again, I wouldn't try to make this complicated. Uh, I know most of you, maybe none of you, have had gifted estate taxes, of course, yet. Um, having said that, some of this stuff is pretty intricate about um, will clauses that uh, what's called a pecuniary bequest versus not. So some of the esoteric stuff, fear not. You're not going to see that on the final exam, but um, you, you, you should be aware of it. I did 
uh, call to your attention, and I want to say this. So the good news is we're starting this at the beginning of the class as opposed to when you might be fading out at 8.30 or 8.45. That the material that we're about to cover <coughs> on page 242 is important. Important that you, know, you can expect to see it in some form or fashion on the final exam because it makes for good multiple choice questions or short essay questions. Oh, after our break, what we'll do is I will distribute um, the midterm exam, the essay portion, and we'll go through those questions, okay? So uh, it will give you, a, and we can talk about the exam and whatnot, okay? So there's another agenda. You're, you're waiting, is he gonna, did he grade it? Did he talk? Okay, so did that work for everyone too? All right. So, oh, let me pause for a moment and say for those, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, on a Wednesday, it's always hard for me to ask people what they did the following weekend. But um, <clears throat> anyone do anything interesting? Because I will say, this past weekend, it was a lot of fun. I had the alumni event uh, that CJ was there. Is there anyone else from work? Adrian was there. Uh, Adrian, CJ, I thought it was fun. What do you think? Well, you're going to be biased. You're not going to say no to me. <laughs> it was a murder mystery. So we got one hour of tax and uh, tax lecturing. Uh, so it's good to see some of my current and former students up, up, up to bat. And um, then we had to solve who, who did it. And fortunately, I didn't feel guilty because I was not the murderer. Uh, and it's, but uh, uh, next year, if you didn't go this year, okay. But next year, if you can put it on your docket, uh, things to do, um, we'll try to come up with another idea of, uh, uh, of events. So, uh, that's uh, certainly, from my perspective, a lot of fun. All right, so there was some foreshadowing that on, if you can, question 3-27 is emblematic of a kind of question that you'll want to focus on uh, because um, if, you can, if you can make sure you know how to respond to these questions on page 242, I, it will be very helpful for you on the exam. So, Anthony, we're on page 242. In a year in which an estate has DNI, none of its tax exempt for 20,000. So DNI is an important concept, right? It's our measuring rod, right? It sets a cap on what's possibly taxable to the beneficiaries, right? It distributes $5,000 cash to a beneficiary who received a $5,000 general bequest that her decedent's will, <coughs> and it distributes. $5,000 cash, securities were then worth $10,000, and real estate then worth $15,000 to the re residuary beneficiary. So keep in mind, there's obviously two beneficiaries in this will, right? Someone who's receiving $5,000 of cash, and someone else who's receiving three separate things, cash, securities, and real estate. And I think the reason the authors are using then value, just so you know, is they're saying, I assume, that Code Section 1014 applied when the person died, right? It applies universally, right? Basis equal to fair market value rule, right, Lisa? So that controls for date of death, but when, keep in mind, when distributions are made, ordinarily it takes a year or two to distribute assets from an estate because estate taxes, debts have to be paid, estate taxes have to be paid, Closing letters have to be received, release of refunding bonds have to be received. So often there is a time lapse between date of death and the receipt, right, from an estate. I recall from our last class that in yesteryear, people tried to keep the states open as long as possible, right? Yesteryear. Why? To take advantage of the lower tax rates. And the IRS would come in and say, hey, you have no excuse to keep this estate open. Now, what's the philosophy? After 1986, it's been flipped because Code Section 1E, the rates are essentially your tax at the highest marginal rate, right? All right, under local law, title to real estate passed directly from the decedent to the residuary beneficiary. What that means is, I presume, <coughs> The real estate was in joint name with, with the beneficiary, right? So it passed 
not as part of the estate. It was a non-probate asset. Everyone catch that? It was not part of the estate. It was in joint name, I presume, by that sentence. However, the executor is entitled to possession of such property during administration. So that means is, suppose the person who dies here holds it jointly with their daughter. The person dies, it takes several months, the executor is responsible for keeping up the property. It's held several months, and then, and only then, is a distribution made. Okay, so someone has to pay that, the insurance on the house, uh, cut the lawn, keep the heat on so the pipes don't burst, and the executor does that until the daughter can take ownership. The estate's basis in the securities is 4000 and its basis in the re real estate is twelve. So I, I did a little handwritten chart here in my, in my book where I have just the basis, fair market value, just we have securities, we have real estate, Calculate the amount subject to taxation under Code Section 662 in the hands of each beneficiary. Why was this 662 and not 652? Rashida, you want to? Just curious if you caught on. Why 662 and not 652? It's a complex trust, right? And that's true because it's an estate. And by, by definition, all estates are complex trusts, right? And Muhammad, we're on page 242. Okay? <clears throat> and we're just looking at the first problem on that page. All right? So to calculate the amount subject to taxation under 662 in the hands of each beneficiary. There are two beneficiaries, okay? Take 30 seconds, I'll keep my mouth shut. Come up with numbers for beneficiary one and beneficiary two. Beneficiary one gets taxed on how much is out? Uh, ten thousand. Ten thousand. Would you agree? Ten. I'm sorry. Yeah. Why? Because the five thousand is in the class. So he gets taxed on how much? Ten. Why do you say ten if he gets five? No, I'm saying. Is that I, I, what am I missing? There's some miscommunication. Um, because the fair market value is ten. That's why I say ten. No, beneficiary one is the one who gets five thousand dollars in cash. So beneficiary one receives five thousand dollar general bequest, and then the other beneficiary receives five thousand dollars in cash, securities, and real estate. Oh, uh, there's two beneficiaries sorry, here, guys. So uh, I was say the first beneficiary is zero. So zero, Lisa. What's your authority, Lisa? Uh, six sixty three. Six sixty three. A one. Right. Everyone agree? The first Anthony, you got that? First beneficiary, zero tax. That's my authority, 663A1. Tina, you got it? Okay. Think hard, think, think carefully. Beneficiary 2. Anthony, what do you say? And then Tina, see if you agree. And Hershey, did you get the final word? I'm going to say 5,000. 5,000. Tina? Now, Brett, I'll throw you in his final word. So, Tina, come up. Hershey, then Brett. How much? 30. 30. Rashida. Ted, Brett. First answer was 5,000. Is that right? You say five. Yeah, I think five. Mohammed, you're a little late to the table. Do you give an answer there? CJ? Uh, go 11,000. 
11. <laughs> Yoni? I thought it was 30. 30. Dale? 20. 20. Jenny? Five thousand. You're whispering. <laughs> Five thousand. Five thousand. Five? Anyone else have a different answer? Athesa? Zell? Adrian? 20. Say again, Adrian? Nine. Nine? Uh, I say 20. 20? Deza? I think I'll say five. Five? We got one winner in the crowd. Adrian. Look at it. Look at you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Adrian, explain how you got your answer. I just picked a number. I can't remember explaining. This is not what I wanted to hear. Well, I, I think it's because of the adjusted bases and the different Okay, let, let, let's take one thing off the table. The real estate we're going to take off the table, right? Because it's a non-probate asset. It does not pull out DNI. You want authority for that? I don't blame you. Uh, revenue ruling 68-49, page 197. I'll repeat. Revenue ruling 68-49, page 197. <clears throat> Says non probate assets do not pull out DNI. Makes sense, right? It's not part of the estate, agreed? So everyone agreed that's off the table, agreed? David, we're on page 242. Your timing is impeccable because everyone in the class is at the edge of their seat. I know this is a very important question. You also know it's going to be on the final exam. So, David, have a quick seat. Open your notebook. We're, we're looking at problem 3-27A. Okay, again, what? Yeah, start with the ruling again. It's revenue ruling 68-49. And it's uh, on page 197 of the textbook. And I emphasize that because um, Picture, if you will, if you have property that's not part of the probate estate, right? You don't, you don't, the executor has no control over that property, right? Meaningful control. Can't, can't ask a person to collect taxes on it, income taxes on it. So you can't pull out DNI. Everybody really agree? Assets that are not part of the probate estate cannot pull out DNI. And non-probate assets generally, guys, are things like life insurance, retirement assets, jointly held property. Those are the three most typical non-probate assets. Probate assets are those assets in the decedent's own name, right? Yes, a retirement account is in the decedent's own name, but it has a beneficiary designation form, right? So it's non-probate. The will does not control its disposition. So again, David, we're on page 242, we're on problem set 3-27A, and we have two beneficiaries, David, here. We have the first beneficiary receiving $5,000 of cash. We decided that first beneficiary has no taxable income because it's a 663 specific uh, it's a, uh, distribution, right? Code section 663. The second beneficiary is receiving three assets, cash for 5,000, Securities worth 10 and real estate, but the real estate is non probate, so it's off the table. So we want to know this, this estate has $20,000 of DNI. And if David were the beneficiary of this estate and he's getting the securities and he's getting cash, and I emphasized during the course of last class, and I said even though it was downplayed in the text, it's a very important code section. Very, very important one. Did I say the word very? Very, very, very important one. It's code section 643E2. Let's look at it together. This is one that a lot of people miss, but not this class, right? And we're going to have 643 open, 643E2.
What's the amount of distribution? In the case of any distribution of property other than cash, and that's it, securities, right guys? The amount taken into account under 662, that's us, right? Appreciate it would tell us that an estate is a complex trust, right? <clears throat> Shall be the lesser of the basis of such properties in the hands of the beneficiaries determined under paragraph one, or the fair market value. What's the basis of the that's under E1? The adjust basis of such property in the hands of the estate immediately before the distribution. Ariel. All right, everyone see that? So, what's the lesser of the two? 4,000, right? So, it says the amount of the distribution is not treated as 10,000, but rather 4,000, right? Plus the beneficiary got cash. So, What's, it, what's considered the total distribution here for purposes of 662? 9,000. Patrick, we're on page uh, 242. Well, you just missed the first answer. Make sure during the break you talk to Anthony and you get the answer. Thank you. It's important. Okay, very important. Everyone see that the right answer here under the authority of code section 642, E2 is $9,000. And um, I think it's important, and that if you don't mind me making this observation, every single one of you got it wrong, but Adrian, if you don't mind, I'm going to say you got it right, which is great, but you said you weren't quite sure how you got there. So uh, it behooves you to make sure, you know, for the final exam, you can replicate this and get the right answer. And then in practice, I know the temptation's gonna lurk, right? A lot of accountants, lots of attorneys think the amount of the distribution is fair market value. It ain't so. And then, of course, the second part of the question says, what is the basis, right? Uh, calculate the basis of both the securities and real estate it's in the hands of the receiver beneficiary. Well, the real estate, is simply going to be 12, right? We know that, right? The authority there is code section um, 1014. It's presumably the basis that was created at death, right? What's the basis in the securities? David, what do you think? What's your authority? You're not going to find it. David, look at code section 643E1. What does it say? It's entitled beneficiary of a basis of beneficiary, right? You got it open? And keep reading. What does it say? Uh, the adjusted basis of such property that has up in state. Well, it's story with the prefacing language. The basis of oh, beneficiary. No, the basis of the basis basis of of beneficiary, right. Right, received by a beneficiary in a distribution from an estate or trust shall be adjusted based on such property in the hands of the estate or trust immediately before the distribution. Okay, stop right there. It's the adjusted basis, right? Yes. Now, admittedly, it says adjusted by any gain or loss recognized, but 99.9999999999% there ain't going to be no gain or loss, right? So most of the time, it's just going to be carryover basis. Everyone got that? That's very important. Again, I want people to succeed on the final exam. You'll see a problem just like this, OK? So just make sure you can handle this. It's not complicated. It, you know, the big um, <clears throat> misunderstanding, again, people focus on the fair market value. They, for whatever reason, don't focus on the adjusted basis. 
but there's no leakage here, right? 642, E1 and E2 are like peanut butter and jelly, they go together, there's no leakage, right? So, uh, what is the real estate base? What, what? what is the real estate base? Is 12, 12. under code section 1014. Carry over base 2. What, what, what? That's a carry over base 2. When you say carry over, this property really is flowing directly from the decedent, not from the estate. Uh, so the word carry over is probably a misnomer in this context. Uh, you understand why? It's really a basis the person receives as, uh, as a result of death. Okay. I meant to send you, well, I'll talk about it in a few minutes. Okay, so we got that. Ready to move on? Everyone got 3-27. Patrick, you're going to get it during the break, right? Or from ZJ, wherever you wish. 3-28. <clears throat> Assume the same facts as 3-27, except the residuary beneficiary uh, receives a car instead of real estate. The car is worth 15, and the estate basis in it is 12. So let's change up. And the car, the car is not part of the non probate estate. If, let me repeat that. The real estate, we said it was non probate, agreed? It went by automatically by way of law. It was not part of the probate estate. The car is part of the probate estate. Everyone agree? Part of the probate estate. Okay. Calculate the amount subject to taxation. So we have two beneficiaries again. The first beneficiary is receiving $5,000 of cash. The other one's receiving these three assets. Cash, securities, and the car. Everyone agree? Cash, securities, and the car. Let me help you with the first one. The person receiving the cash is receiving a specific or particular dollar amount and under 663A1, no tax. How's that? Easy, right? No tax. Without saying it out loud, think about this for 30 seconds. Each of you come up with a taxable amount to the uh, residuary beneficiary who's receiving those three assets. Second beneficiary gets taxed on what? Anthony, give me a number. 20,000. Muhammad. 21,000. Tina. Rashida. Money? CJ? 20. David? 21,000. Yeah? No? I say 20. Money? Lisa? 21. Ready? 21. Yeah? 20. Jenny, final word? 20, 21. All right, half of you got it right, half of you got it wrong. Right answer, look up at the ceiling. Everyone looking up? What do you see? You see 20, don't you? Is it D and I, 20 here? Doesn't that set the ceiling? Can't be taxed on more than the D and I, right guys? Right, David? But the like Eve's apple, right? It lurked, right? Temptation lurked. That apple looked red. So, yes, you're tempted to say the person should be taxed on 21, but D and I caps what the person can be taxed on, right? Can't be taxed in excess of DNI. So the correct answer here is under 662A2, 20,000. Would you think that was tricky if I asked a similar question on the final exam? No. Right? Now that you did this, right? Adrian, you got that? What's the basis, Adrian, in the two, the two pieces of property, the securities and the car? That's the second part of the question. Um, more than 12. More than 12. What's your authority? What code section? 643E1. You got it. Bingo. Everybody have that, right? Three.
3-29. Would it matter if the residuary beneficiary in 3-28 had been entitled to the card or a specific request rather than a residuary request, right? Would that have changed the outcome? Think for a minute. I'll keep my mouth shut for a minute. Come up with how you think it would change the outcome. All right, we'll start with uh, down below. Jenny? Um, I was, it means a uh, residuary beneficiary. Yeah, let, let's start with the residuary beneficiary gets taxed on what? Uh, 9,000. 9,000. Dale? Uh, I know, Maddie. I'll come back to you in a second. Yoni? 9,000. Lisa? 9. Uh, is that? Uh, yeah, 9,000. David? I'm not sure. That's for a CJ? 9,000. Rashida? 9,000. Tina? Jill? 9. 9. Nine is correct. Why? It's because, Hoshida, you were going to say? Just say it loud. Cash is five and the security. Cash is five and the security is a basis of four. So five plus four is nine because the car now under code section 663 is a specific request, right? And if you look at 643E4, look at 643E4. It says, if it's described as 663A, it's off the table. It's off the table. Meaning it's not part of 643E. It's under 663, it's not under 643, right, Joe? Okay. So does that mean who's your beneficiary's basis in the car is not adjusted? Well, your, the beneficiary's basis in the car is determined under Code Section 1014. Right? Okay. So the trust doesn't have to recognize getting out of distribution? It does not. It's not satisfying a specific request of the dollar amount. It's not satisfying a debt. Just, I have to give you the car. Uh, okay. Right? There's okay. Okay? So here, um, the answer would be tax law 9000, what's my authority? 643E2. Um, and that would make the person taxable under 662A2, again, on $9,000. The securities, I'm sure David or Adrian would say, Adrian, the, the securities in this problem, the basis would be $4,000. That's our authority, 643E1. Problem 3-30, assume that the same fax is 3-28, except that $10,000 of the estate's distribution, D and I, is tax exempt income. How would that change the outcome if it was $10,000 taxable and $10,000 uh, non-taxable? Well, we already said, what was, how much was the person taxed on? What did we say when we looked up at the ceiling? 20, right? You already great? And if the person could be taxed on the DNI, and we know the character comes out to that individual, right? And if 10 is taxable and the 10 is tax exempt, guess what? Under 662B, the character is going to be 10,000 taxable, 10,000 tax exempt, right? Anyone falling off the chair when I say that? No. Three dash thirty one. Assume the facts of problem three dash twenty seven, except that the executor, pursuant to authority granted in the decedent's will, funds the five thousand dollar general bequest with securities worth four, uh, worth five thousand instead of cash. And the estate's basis in the securities is four thousand dollars.
And what are the tax consequences? And would the answer in 3 27 be different? So take a minute, think about it. Mohammed, have any thoughts here? Uh, the estate would recognize the town of non Right? But why? Because, uh, the request is five thousand dollars, and that's going to be non-taxable to the beneficiary. So, what's your authority? Just from here on. So you know, Patrick, do you have authority? Uh, I don't have authority, but I, I, I do approve for the service because. So the, I agree. That's not our game, but we need authority. <laughs> Lisa. Keenan, please. The Keenan, right? Keenan case, right? We have a thousand dollar. Would that change Thesa? Would that change the outcome in three dash twenty seven? Since we now have a thousand dollar gain here. Would there be any change in the outcome? Should I guess no? No? Nice yours. Jeff? Any difference in the outcome? Jody? It would, but it's part of the, it wouldn't, it wasn't a specific request. So I don't know what you mean, it would. Because it's supposed to, the, it's what you're supposed to take the less, the adjusted basis. Okay, but, but this is a 663, adjusted. so it doesn't, it's not going to pull out DNI. Agreed? Right, right. CJ, you were going to say something? I was going to say there's no there's no difference. Right. Would it be a difference in, let me just rephrase it, in the problem where we were capped and we looked at the ceiling and the cap was, you know, in problem 3 28, right? Where um, you guys t were tempted to say 21, right? Some said 20, some said 21. We looked at the ceiling and DNI was 20. Everyone agree? Mm -hmm. And you said, oh, you're right, we can only include 20. In that problem, would we now include 21? Yes. No. You say yes? Say and you say no? no? Yes. And CJ, just tell us why you say no, and then Dill, you'll tell us why you say yes. Well, DNI doesn't include capital gains. Just say it loudly. DNI doesn't include capital gains, right? Okay. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. A lot of people think, oh, the income of the estate went up by a thousand. Income goes up by a thousand. DNI goes up by a thousand. Right? Isn't that like a religion? You think about that like that? Yeah. Jenny, right? You might have been thinking that. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Are you thinking that way? Which way? <laughs> that when the trust, when the estate had a thousand dollars of income, as a result of making this distribution, you might have thought that DNI went up by a thousand. Depends. It does, okay? So that's a good answer. But just be careful because there's going to be a temptation to think that DNI goes up by a thousand, but under 643, uh, 643 specifically says DNI does not include capital gains except in certain circumstances. So the answer would be the same as above, but I just want to point out why there may have been a t temptation there to think otherwise. And Muhammad, you got this Keenan. Don't ever forget Keenan, right? Wrote it down. Right? Famous case. Okay, use it at the cocktail party this weekend. Alright, so um, any questions on that? You're good with that? And the final question says, suggest situations in which the fiduciary might elect recognize gain under 643E, right? There's an opportunity to choose to elect gains, right? When the, when the estate makes a distribution. But let's face it. Um, um, are we going to meet too many estates that the fiduciary is going to choose to recognize gain. If 
the fiduciary does, or the executor, remember, executors are where there is a, a will that names someone, just get our terms of art right. And an administrator is when someone dies without a will or dies in testing. Everyone got the terminology? So whether it be an executor or an administrator, they're again not going to elect to recognize the gain, at least in my opinion, unless they get letters from all the beneficiaries authorizing them to do so. Right? That's not something you're just going to do on your own volition. Because most the estate, if it bears a tax indirectly, is going to be borne by the beneficiaries. And they may say, look, let us take the property with a lower basis. And when we sell it, we'll recognize the gain then. Why pay tax now? Right? Lisa, do you have a question? All right. So, um, any questions on this? You guys, go back through this. I implore you, make sure you really have a good command of this. And if you have any questions, let me know, okay? 643E is one of those code sections. Doesn't get the publicity of 643A, uh, you know, D and I computations. But in my mind, <clears throat> it harbors the same importance. Not quite the same, but close. Um, there's a revenue ruling that follows 69-486. Not going to come up too often in your practice. <coughs> what does this revenue ruling say? Is that if I die and I bequeathed assets to Tina and Hershida, and I have assets of equivalent fair market value, okay? I have car and securities, both worth 15, okay? Both worth 15. And I bequeath those, that's my entire estate. And my entire estate gets split 50-50 between Tina and Hershita, right? They should each take a one half interest in this property. If they decide between themselves, like Hershita is in a lower tax bracket, right? She says, oh, I'll take the securities because um, when I recognize the gain, I'll have less tax money come in. Tina says, oh, let me have the car because I'm in a higher tax bracket and I only have to have $3,000 worth of gain, right? Um, this revenue ruling says that that could trigger a gain between Tina and Hershita as if they had a de facto exchange, right? That they each exchange, excuse me, one half of the property with each other. And it's just a cautionary tale that you have to be careful. All right, that's, that's the whole takeaway from this revenue rule. All right, so let me just talk in general about some cases here in chapter four, and then we'll get into, and, and this unit is entitled The Entity Ignored. I pointed out to you last class that um, this is not unusual in the sphere of business because many people conduct businesses through what are known as single member LLCs. They might have a corporate entity here, and for liability sake, they have three different pieces of real estate, A, B, and C, which are all held by single member LLCs, and these LLCs are ignored as separate legal entities, and they're all taxed on the Form 1120, but they want to keep, for liability purposes, these three entities separate and apart, right? So single member LLCs, um, very important in the business sphere. Um, we're going to talk about grantor trusts, which, again, 30,000 feet up, are generally ignored for tax purposes. Ignored. Now, as we delve into this chapter, think about it this way. In yesteryear, was grantor's trust status good or bad in yesteryear? Is this something do taxpayers like or dislike grantor trust status in general? Generally, did 
when? Back when? This like back pre eighty six. Oh, Did they like or dislike grand tour trust debt? And why did they dislike it? You lose out on the trust Just say it loud. You lose out on the trust rates? You lose out on the trust rates, right? There was a lot to be said where people wanted to avail themselves of the lower tax brackets of trust, right? Everybody agree? There was a lot there in terms of tax savings. If you could, and if the IRS came in, I left my, my prompt prop uh, for Halloween. I should have brought my sword here. The IRS could use the grantor trust rules, right? The grantor trust rules were a sword that Congress bestowed upon the IRS to say, you know what? If you have sufficient indicia of ownership, we're going to treat the grantor as owner. Okay? So that thwarted a lot of tax planning. That thwarted a lot of tax planning because if it was taxable to the grantor, whose rates were as high as 70%, they were not happy campers. Agreed? What we will see, and we've seen if, you know, this transformation after 1986, is grantor trust that is now something to be avoided, like the fight it used to be, but now the answer is no. Many times, particularly, and I'll talk in more in depth this class and next class and the following class, more and more people are seeking, actively seeking grantor trust status. In fact, if on your own, if you want to Google it, there is an instrument that many estate planners use called an intentionally defective grantor trust. Effect, intentionally defective grantor trust. What? And by the way, when I talk to clients about this, they do not like and hear me when I say it was not my choice. I did not give this moniker to the trust. Whoever came up with it did not was not in market. <laughs> Who wants to call something you want to have clients spend lots of money on and call it defective? So. The first thing the client says is, what do you, you want to charge X dollars and set up a, a, a defective trust? I'm, I kid you not, okay, truly. So whoever came up with this, uh, I think has to read, well, sort of now stuck in blood. Um, if I get a chance next, before next class, what I was gonna say is, um, I've written about my misgivings about grantor trust status. In fact, if you've got the, uh, 2016 supplement to our case book. I proudly say, and maybe the authors were just being nice to me, but they mentioned my article in, in the update to, as an article to be read. Okay, so I take a small amount of pride in that, so I'll send you that uh, the article. Um, any event, so I'm not a big fan about how the, in, in the aftermath of 1986, it, that do we need the grantor trust rules anymore, okay? Do we need the grantor trust rules? But they have been a vibrant part of the code now for close to 80 years. So uh, I, I can't, my crystal ball is a little foggy. Um, I don't think you're going away tomorrow. So um, I will try to highlight those things about them, those attributes that you guys really have to be aware of. Um, and I will try to point out those things that you're never going to see, ever. Um, so let me walk you through the woods here about grantor trust. All right? So, any questions in journal about grantor trust? Okay. All right. Well, um, what the authors do uh, at the very beginning of this chapter is talk about something that most of you, who at least had made for income tax, you have seen these cases before, okay? You may or may not remember the details of these cases, but you have seen them before. They're in chapter 12 of the income tax textbook. And if you recall that chapter, you may not. Uh, those authors divide this material uh, when they discuss the assignment of income doctrine into income from services versus income from property, okay? So there's a bifurcation 
Um, and generally, let's start with broad, um, broad propositions and then we'll drill down. Broad proposition with respect to services performed. Who gets tax on services performed? Challenging question, and I think everyone knows the answer. Whoever performs the services gets taxed, right? And that's uh, reflected in Lucas v. Earl, right? The case that started this whole doctrine, right? Lucas v. Earl. And if you recall, Mr. Earl entered into a contractual arrangement with his wife that predated the income tax. And so it certainly wasn't tax motivated. But remember, it was not until 1948 in which there was anything like a joint tax return. As a result of this contractual arrangement, whether or not it was tax motiva motivated or not, Mr. Earl earned the money. And if he could have his wife taxed on half of it, it could result in significant tax savings, right? If he could have his wife taxed on half of it. Could he? And um, if you read this case by Justice Holmes, he came up with the famous fruit and the tree metaphor that essentially says that if you grew the if you grew the fruit, okay, you get taxed on it, right? If you grew the apples, the apples are taxable to you. Everyone agree? Not a hard proposition. Some of the laws here, by the way, that the authors describe on 246 in, in the material that follows the case, and you look at community property laws under the illustrated material, paragraph three, how women were treated economically, and you say, boy, this was less than 100 years ago, and it was the males were controlling every aspect of a woman's economic existence, and you're like, Wow, this is this is our country less than a hundred years ago. It's it's kind of harsh. So um, it says uh, in the court, Justice Holmes, right in the court, had described community property interest in California of a California wife as quote unquote a mere expectancy by living with her husband. Ouch. Okay, so. Just, I'm just calling to your attention my observation that uh, our country had, uh, had quite a few uh, shortcomings. I think we all know that along its path to glory. Um, I, don't know if, I don't know if we want to go back and make America great like it was back then. That's my point, I guess. Um, all right. Any of it. Um, so everyone got Lucas Fierro, the proposition is simple. Whoever earns the in income is taxable to it. In Blair v. Commissioner, why, again, why are we going through these cases? Because in each of these cases, there's a nugget that's going to give us an idea of why Congress form the Grand Tour Trust Rules, okay? So in each of these cases, there's verbiage that, of some sort that is going to evolve into what we will see are the Grand Tour Trust Rules. So it's not that the authors or two authors want to teach us about the assignment of income, but there's an evolution of why Congress felt implored to institute the Grand Tour Trust Rules. So in Clarity Commissioner, someone gives away their entire income interest in a trust. They give away the entire income interest. And there's first litigation. As I've explained to you, most trusts, any trust I've ever seen created, have what's called a spendthrift provision. A spendthrift provision, a spendthrift provision prohibits people from assigning away their interest. A spendthrift provision, right? If I die and I give these uh, um, an income interest, okay? I'm going to have a provision in there because I gave it to Thesa for her life. I don't want Thesa to be able to go sell it to someone, excuse me, Thesa, that you have a drug habit, right? 
I want to, that the whole reason I created this trust for your lifetime is I want to ensure your economic well-being. So it has a spendthrift provision, right? And virtually every trust you'll ever come across will have a spendthrift provision. Having said that, there was some litigation about whether or not this interest could be given away. And let's assume for the moment it was legitimately given away. The question is, who gets taxed on that income interest? The recipient or the person who gave it away? And in this case, because the person gave away the entirety of the tree, the recipient got taxed on it. The recipient, not the person who had the initial interest. In contrast, in Hellbring v. Horst, in, in, bad, in, in strict contrast to the Blair decision, in Hellbring v. Horst, the person had a bond with, with detachable interest group bonds. They had a bond, say a $10,000 bond, that paid $500 interest annually. And these were detachable. Each year, the person could collect $500. And the person detached an interest coupon and gave it to the child and said, oh, you cash it in. You get taxed on it. And in Hell Ring Me Horse, they said, no, no, no. If you hold on to the tree, namely the bond itself, and you just give away the apples, you, you remain taxable on the apples, right? You hold on to the tree, you give away the apples, you remain taxable on the apples, right? That's the holding in, of hell grain be forced. And the authors go through some other examples in this case. Oh, and I'll, I'll just, again, this language you'll see uh, in, in the grantor trust rules. On page 251, the, the paragraph, paragraph, last paragraph on 251 going into 252, um, says the power to dispose of income is the equivalent of ownership of it. Everyone see, if you have the power to control something, it becomes taxable to you. And it, uh, I'd like to go further. If you go to the second full paragraph on page 251, eight or nine lines down in the second paragraph, it says, even though he never receives the money, he derives money's worth from the disposition of the coupons, which he has used as money or money's worth in procuring the satisfaction, which is procurable only by expenditure of money or money's worth. Again, just highlighting some of the verbiage that we're going to see in, in these um, upcoming uh, rules. Um, and at the very bottom of page 252, the last sentence that goes on to the next page on 252, when by gift of the coupons, he has separated his right to interest payments from his investment and procured the payment of the interest to his donee, is enjoy the economic benefits of the income in the same manner to the same extent as though the transfer were of earnings. And in both cases, the import of the statute is that the fruit is not to be attributed to a different tree than upon which it grew. Okay, so again, lots of language that you don't have to physically touch money to be taxed on, right? Everyone get that? These assignment of income uh, cases I, I commonly refer to as it's not part of the Jerry Maguire school, right? If you recall that movie, Jerry Maguire was always show me the money. Here you don't have to be shown the money. You can still be tax blind, even though it's not reduced to your physical possession. And um, on page 254, again, one more. These are all Supreme Court decisions. We had the Harrison decision. Okay. Here, the person is assigning for one year, one year, their income interest in a trust. Okay, assigning for one year, their income interest in a trust. Who should be taxed 
And not surprisingly, the IRS wrote with the IRS. The U.S. Supreme Court reverses the tax court, reverses the appeals court, and says the IRS is right. The grantor should be taxed. those decisions are controlling here on page 255, page 255, that paragraph, if you go 10 or 11 lines down towards the right, it starts off by saying, we think it is quite another matter to say that the beneficiary of a trust who makes a single gift of a sum of money payable out of income of the trust does not realize income when the gift is effectuated by payment, or that he escapes the tax by attempting to close the transaction in the guise of a transfer of trust property rather than the transfer of income where that is its obvious purpose and effect. And it keeps going on further down. It says, the donor retaining every other um, substantial interest in. So it's, it's saying that, you know, if you give away, again, a small portion, but you retain the item, the tree that grows that, you remain taxable on the income. So it's essentially treated as a essentially treated as a tax-free gift to the. Uh, it is a tax-free gift to the uh, recipient. To the giver, right? Okay, but the income is going to be taxable to the grant to the, the the person who gave it away. So let me just, now we're about to go into, so those are just general propositions under the Assignment of Income Doctrine, okay? That the Supreme Court out of whole cloth crafted to say that, again, even though you don't have fiscal possession of income, but you control it, the control alone is enough to cause you to be taxed, right? And that's important, and that's why it's here for what we're going to look for in the grant for trust rules. Um, so we know, generally, a trust is treated as a separate legal entity, right? I mean, that's what we've been spending several weeks looking at. And um, having said that, we are now going to see instances where notwithstanding it's considered a separate legal entity, Congress has decided it should be negated and ignored. And even though the Clifford case, Hell Ray v. Clifford, and I know everyone in this room feels a certain sense of uh, uh, loyalty or, or I don't know, endearment when you see the word Hellbrink because he is our former commissioner and adorns so many of our cases. Um, Hellbrink v. Clifford is the ship, what, what's the cliche? The blank that launched a thousand ships. Help me out here. Isn't there some cliche, something that launched a thousand ships? I think we'll go. All right, there is some. Clifford, though, certainly was. Uh, uh, one of the key cases, okay, in this sphere, it's been legislatively overruled, but you can't, in my opinion, and the author feels strongly too, obviously, about this, you can't have a meaningful discussion about the grantor trust rules without knowing the Clifford case. And, you know, there's famous cases that you see in income tax, there's famous cases in uh, corporate tax, partnership tax, well, in this area, guys, this is it. This is about as famous as you can get. And 
you will periodically see references to so-called Clifford trusts, okay? Older cases, um, and, and Clifford trusts had massive popularity during the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and part of the 80s. Clifford trusts, I, I, back then, it was a gold mine for attorneys and accountants to set up Clifford trusts, okay? Uh, and we will see why in a moment, but that was it. Clifford Trusts were probably the most utilized tax savings device uh, that, that came from this era, okay? So that behooves you to look at the Clifford case, um, see what's going on. So um, with that in mind, let's talk about it. In 1934, Mr. Clifford declared himself trustee of certain securities and set up an irrevocable trust. And he, not to say this is that important, but I'll just call to your attention. He paid gift time and gift tax at the time the trust was created. The trust was to last for a period of five years. It would terminate on his death or that of his wife. Clifford was to serve as trustee. Just highlighting all those things that sort of give him indicia of control of this trust, right? As trustee, trust terminates on his death, his wife's death. The trustee had discretion to distribute income to his wife. If he didn't, so he can control, somewhat control beneficial enjoyment. If she didn't get it, it would go to his wife on termination. So definitely, the only question regarding income was when she would get, get it, not if she would get it. There's no joint tax return, right? There's no joint tax returns. That's important. Was this tax motivated to set this up? What did the taxpayer say? No. Why did the taxpayer say he set this up? You recall any language here? Security and economic impact. You got it. On the bottom of page 257, the last full paragraph, third line down, it says, he intended to give his wife security and economic independence. I don't know if your spouse here, if you feel truly in economically independent, okay, as a result of this trust, guys. But certainly, if the trust were going to be respected, would he minimize his tax? Yes or no? Yes. Certainly yes, because it's either going to be taxed to the trust at its lower rates, then rates, or it's going to be taxed to the wife at her lower rates, right, if it's distributed to her. Agreed? So the issue is, whether the trust should be respected or the taxpayer as the grantor should be taxed on the income of the trust earns. Okay, isn't that the issue confronting the U.S. Supreme Court? Why is the IRS, or what, what is the argument of the IRS here? The IRS is saying akin to Supreme Court You've looked at other cases akin to this, right, in the Assignment of Income Doctrine, the Supreme Court, and you have ruled where a taxpayer has enough indicia of ownership, right, that the taxpayer should be taxed, right? And, you know, the Lucas V. Earl cases, Alvary V. Horse, so it's all that language, right, that if you control income, you should be taxed on it. And the IRS says, Supreme Court, you, you've gone out on a limb and you've said that. And here, there's several factors that say 
the grantor should remain the owner. The trust was short term. The wife is the alter ego of the taxpayer. Clifford was the trustee. All those factors say that essentially he retained control over this property, right? That he didn't give up much. And this is spelled out on um, page 258, the third full paragraph starts off in this case, if you look at the second sentence, rather the short duration of the trust, the fact that the wife was the beneficiary, and the retention of control of the corpus by respondent all lead irresistibly to the conclusion that respondent continued to be the owner for purposes of section 22A. Now, section 22 is the predecessor, right, to code section 61. The next paragraph continues. So far as his dominion and control were concerned, it seems clear that the trust did not affect any substantial change. Everyone see that? Did not affect any substantial change. It goes on in that same paragraph, four or five, six lines later in the middle. It says, we have at best a temporary reallocation of income within an intimate family group. Since the income remains in the family, and since the husband retains control over the investment, he has rather complete assurance that the trust will not, I circled the word not in red, affect any substantial change in his economic position. It is hard to imagine that a respondent felt himself poorer after the trust had been executed, or if he did, if he had any rational foundation in fact. So the court here says that essentially the taxpayer is in the same economic position before and after. In the dissent, what is the strongest argument so that the taxpayer loses, IRS prevails? Why? This is an extension of many of the cases we just looked at in the assignment of income realm. What is this? There is a dissenting opinion here. What is the strongest argument made by the dissenting judge? What is the strongest argument made by the dissenting judge? Dale? Yeah. That it's trust and that it should be looked at differently. Well, there is a trust, but the majority saw that as a trust too, it just said the trust shouldn't be respected. The strongest argument, and it gives you pause, I think the dissent has a pretty good case here. Congress considered instituting legislation before this trust was created that said that short-term trusts should be ignored and treated, should be ignored for tax purposes, that they should not be treated as legitimate, okay? That legislation was never adopted. So Congress looked at this and never adopted. And here the Supreme Court is saying, well, and remember, Congress is the legislative branch, and it could have adopted a law that would have put the brakes on this kind of arrangement, but it chose not to. It did. What was the law back in the 1930s? What kind of trust was ignored for tax purposes? And this is easy. Any revocable trust, right? Any revocable trust was going to be a grantor trust, okay? Congress had already put that into law. And there was a movement on the part of the Treasury Department to say, go beyond that, Congress. Go beyond just revocable trust and add to your uh, we, we want another arrow in our quiver that said if you, a short-term trust should be ignored. Everyone agrees with me, I hope you do, that the quintessential grantor trust, the, the quintessential grantor trust is what? A revocable trust, right? If you create a trust instrument, and I just, I can't snap very well, but if you can snap your fingers and make it disappear, does that have any 
meaning to it. If, if you set up a trust and you can snap your fingers and make it disappear and then just take back ownership, does that look like a legal tax entity that the IRS should respect? No. Not even in the morning. Just that same minute it should be ignored, right? All right, so the point is, now, so let me also make another observation. I think mentally this is useful for everyone in this room. Notwithstanding everything we looked at subchapter J and 1041s, what is the most popular kinds of trusts out there in the United States, in the country? Grantor trust or non-grantor trust, guys? If you had a show of hands, who and don't fence it. Help us help me out here. Choose. Are grantor trusts more popular than non-grantor trusts? The first three chapters are we looked at, or chapter four, or grantor trusts more popular than not. Okay, so who says grantor trusts? Who says non-grantor trusts? So the most of you said non-grantor trusts, even though your hands are like this. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna say that's the majority. Well, the majority, you know, often is misplaced and you're misplaced. The vast majority of trusts in the United States are definitely grantor trusts. And you might say, why? Fair statement, or fair question on your part. Why do people use, and the most popular of the grantor trusts are? GST. Revocable trusts. Say again? That was GST. But that's not, those are irrevocable. Okay. And by the way, any trust created in a person's will is going to be testamentary and it's going to be irrevocable. And the first three chapters are going to apply. Okay? But mostly wealthy people set up, you know, I'm going to say the one percenters in the country set up irrevocable testamentary trusts. But most people, I, I will say 60% of the 70% of the country's population don't have too much in the way of assets to give away upon their demise. And those assets they do, they just leave outright to their children, right? Only those people with you know, a fair amount of wealth are going to go get their estate plans done and set up trusts and things like that. But getting back to my story, why are revocable trusts so popular in a country? Okay. Well, yeah. Oh, and I, something I heard I want to repeat, if you don't mind. Hold that thought. I heard someone whisper. Say something. Uh, so they have the low tax rate in the trust? But I, let's put it this way. They categorically, that's not an answer. What I mean by that, and I'm glad you said it, because sometimes my brethren attorney will pitch people, and they will say, oh, there's tax savings with revocable trust. One thing's for sure. There's not a dime of tax savings associated, income tax savings associated with revocable trust. And I can assure you, under Code Section 2036 and other uh, 2037, 2038 of the Internal Revenue Code, which deal with the estate tax, any asset held in a revocable trust is includable in the decedent's gross estate, period. Okay, so it's not going to save a dime of income tax, it's not going to save a dime of estate tax. Okay? I challenge and periodically I'll have a client who will say, oh, my attorney said, or I went to a lecturer who they said, I Googled it and it was said, and I say, bring it on, put me, put me on the phone with that person, I want to hear what they, and inevitably I never, I never talk to anyone, okay, because I'm up for that challenge. All right, so it will not save a dime of income tax, it will not save a dime of estate tax. So, Anthony, getting back to her question, why? One big reason is the assets of wood probate. Okay, that is the biggest reason. Any assets held in the trust avoid the probate process. Agreed? And probate means if you die with an asset in your name, the will controls. What does probate mean again? Just to remind people from our first or second class, what does the process of probate mean? Kill. Absolutely. Well, passes through the will. And what does that mean? Someone dies. What do you have to do? To what does it mean to pass through the will? So now that you say it passes through the will, what does that mean? Part of the estate. Part of the estate, which means you have to go to the court. Everyone know in Essex County, where, where's the courthouse here? If someone dies in Essex County, where do you go? 
Everyone know? You go, you go a few blocks down University Avenue, and there's a beautiful courthouse. Um, William Brennan adorns the outside of it. Um, it's the Essex County Courthouse. It's right near um, Essex County Community College, right? Everyone? In, right? Do you guys know where it is? It's a few blocks from here. Um, you go to the second floor of the courthouse. You go with the, the, the decedent's will. You go with a death certificate. You go with a check for about 100 bucks. You go to the court. A week later, you fill out a questionnaire. They issue you letters testamentary. And then that gives you the authorization to take the decedent's assets, make distributions in accordance with the terms of the will. That's the probate process. And what that means is, Dill or anyone in this room, I die, and my will is probated. And you have curiosity, does hey, does Solo leave it to his uh, wife? Does he leave it to a mistress? Who does he leave it to? Um, you can go to the Essex County Courthouse. I'm in Morris County. You can go to the Morris County Courthouse and look at anyone's will. You want to go to, I would say, if you want to look at Prince's will, you could, but he didn't have a will, so you can't. Um, any famous person you want to look at? I, I don't know. But their will is probably on file with that surrogate court. Okay, in the county they died. So why do you want to avoid probate, Anthony? Two reasons, but one, I think you can get the assets quicker. Probate. Some people would argue you get the assets quicker. There is some argument to that. That in other reasons. One, I just stated one. Maybe someone's a pretty private guy. I don't want one of my first clients had two girlfriends. He wasn't married. <laughs> He didn't want one girlfriend to know about the other girlfriend. I kid you not. Okay, I'm not making this up. And he said, do two revocable trusts. I'll take my chances that they'll never come to my grave at the same time. You remember the Chilean miners, guys? You remember that incident where they were caught underground? And the wife and the girlfriend waited for, that's one guy who I don't know if he ever wanted to come up with the mine. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Very truly, his wife and girlfriend discovered each other uh, as they waited for him to come up. Okay, um, there are people who want to keep your privacy, right? And a will is open to the public. Um, a revocable trust is not, right? Truly. So privacy. Sometimes there's a little bit faster in the way of distributions. And the other reason is that sometimes people own multiple pieces of property outside of New Jersey. Someone dies, you have to get ancillary jurisdiction in the other states in which they own real property, which can be a pain in the neck. So generally my philosophy for clients is I never set up revocable trusts because to me it's one more document and people have to pay more <coughs> to do it. Um, but I have set them up on occasion for people who want to privacy issues. They have property outside the state of New Jersey. And sometimes for the octogenarian widow who wants his or her child, usually it's the wife, she's a widow, and she wants her son or daughter to take over control of her assets. She puts everything in a revocable trust, names her child as the trustee, and he or she can control the assets. Parenthetically, I'll say that they just have a good durable power of attorney in place. They don't need to set up a revocable trust. Your takeaway as we go through this, though, that is the quintessential grantor trust, right? Because Congress doesn't need to respect it, right? Nor should it. And that was the first kind of grantor trust. Clifford, so that legislation was already in effect, and Congress had considered augmenting that legislation, adding provisions, it didn't at the time. And that's why that's why the Supreme Court had a, on its own volition respond with a Clifford decision. But there was really, truth be told, that the Supreme Court was pushing the envelope. It wasn't grounded in legislation. It was grounded on those assignment of income cases, right? So tell me, uh, everyone ready? You know, if you meet with friends, family, or clients, are you able to talk coherently about revocable trust? Yeah, and if not, obviously we're going to be spending more time. But those are pivotal to Chapter Four. Again, we're going to look at other kinds of grantor trust, but certainly those are the most popular. And I'm going to I'm going to explain why, if not this class, next class, 
Here, I'm going to blow your mind because a lot of people can't mentally accept this. We just said revocable trusts or grantor trusts, right? People now will set up irrevocable trusts. Here, what I'm about to say irrevocable trusts, which are grantor trusts. Okay? Irrevocable trusts can be grantor trusts. And believe it or not, they can also be outside the person's taxable estate for purposes of the U.S. estate tax laws. And we'll go through why. But I'm, I don't want you to just think, oh, the only kind of, leave you with a misimpression before I break, the only kind of trust which is a grantor trust is a revocable trust. No, no, no. Lots of irrevocable trusts can be grantor trusts, okay? Why don't we do this, guys? Why don't we take our eight or nine minute break? We'll come back. Here's the agenda for tonight. Come back. We'll go through the problems of the midterm exam. And then um, we'll continue our discussion on grant for trust. And those who came in a bit late, just a heads up. Next class, just a reminder, next class, we're going to go a little bit later until like 9.20, 9.25. Because two classes from now, I have to run down to Baltimore to give a lecture, so we're going to go a little. We're going to go from six to eight with no break on our two two weeks from tonight. So if you came in a bit late. Next week we're going to go a little later, and then uh, two weeks from now we're going to go earlier, and that's I think will even itself in the wash. Take a break. Come back. <laughs>